first and foremost, I want to dedicate my brief comments to the lives of Marilyn Buck as well as Russell Means. Um, and you should look these people up if you don't know who they are. Very important activists um, doing this kind of work. When I think of the prisons, I think of uh, a feeling of rage. And um, whenever I feel that rage, I turn to James Baldwin and I want to read a passage of his discussion of rage from Notes of a Native Son, which you should also have in your collection if you don't already. There is not a black person alive who does not have rage in his blood. One has the choice merely of living with it consciously or surrendering to it. As for me, this fever has recurred in me and does and will until the day I die. Let's start with an assertion. Mass incarceration makes the notion of post-racial America an absurdity. Let's begin there. Because when we begin there, we get closer to understanding what mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex or whatever name we want to put on that are all about. When we begin there, we understand that the gains of the civil rights movement, events of an epic moment in post-racial imaginary were a beginning, not an ending, of a long racial justice struggle. Now surely we have come to know that race is in fact a social construct, but as I teach my students, it must also be true that society is a racial construct. And I think Michelle's work is pointing in that direction. If you're like me, an African-American male growing up in the inner city of Los Angeles, you come up constantly thinking two thoughts. Don't die before age 21 and do all you can to avoid jail time. All sorts of violence seem to structure my world, but one was especially significant and that was the ever-present violence of the police. If we could, we tried to avoid them. Chances were that at some point in our move from adolescence to adulthood, we would have at least one defining encounter. When the LAPD rolled through our community, we gritted our teeth, held our collective breath, and clenched our fists by our sides in anticipation of what they might do. No reason was necessary. For this gang, you were always in the wrong hood. We learned early on to withhold our trust. Almost every young person of color, similar racial and class background, has at least one story of the time they were handcuffed, patted down, interrogated, followed, had drugs planted on them, or been told to put their hands on the hot hood of a police car, and that's pre or post. PhD. This was the kind of special treatment none of us desired. For us, this was our introduction to what social scientists call racial profiling, a crash course on institutional racism. We saw early on that policing and imprisonment went hand in hand. For the we who look like me, black, Latino, and Muslim young women and men from Oakland to Orlando, Denver to Detroit, Newark to New Orleans, Portland to Pittsburgh, this was a fact of life, especially in the 1980s and 90s, and little has changed since, and in many cases, it's gotten worse. Back then, we learned a considerable portion of our education of how the system works. From hip hop, artists coast to coast told endless stories of police misconduct, confirming our own interactions. This coupled with efforts to free Mumia Abu-Jamal from a penitentiary in Pennsylvania, profoundly shifted my understanding of citizenship, belonging, and home. These experiences showed us the ways prisons the world over specialize in institutionalizing dehumanization. And today, we can look at the life-extinguishing results of surveillance that are documented in a recent study by the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, which shows that from January to August of this year, over 100 black women and men lost their lives as a result of excessive force by police or otherwise deputized individuals. 
We should add to this the shackling of women, the ease with which the death penalty is applied and enforced, the shadow of suspicion placed on immigrants, and the hostility directed at black youth, manifesting in a particular form of anti-black racism embedded in the school-to-prison pipeline. It's easy to be cynical about one's prospects in America when this is your reality. Once we take this into account, we have no choice but to confront the issue head on and question our direction. Thus, it cannot be said enough that we need to mobilize the rage that Baldwin spoke of into a rigorous and robust commitment to liberation and free ourselves from our dependence on the carceral state, starting with those routinely racialized, criminalized, and disappeared at one stage of the system or another. Thank you. Now to the main event. Michelle Alexander is a highly acclaimed civil rights lawyer, advocate, and legal scholar who currently holds a joint appointment appointment at the Kieran Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and the Moritz College of Law at The Ohio State University. Prior to joining the Kieran Institute, Professor Alexander was an associate professor of law at Stanford Law School where she directed the civil rights clinics. In 2005, she won a Soros Justice Fellowship which supported the writing of her first book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. The book is considered one of the top African-American books of 2010, and it won the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work of Nonfiction. She's been all over media, Bill Moyers, NPR, Tavis Smiley, C-SPAN, et cetera. Her current work reflects lessons learned over her previous year, years as a, as a civil rights lawyer and advocate in both private and the nonprofit sector. For several years, Professor Alexander has served as the director of the Racial Justice Project for the ACLU of Northern California, where she helped lead a, North, a national campaign against racial profiling by law enforcement. She is a graduate of Stanford Law and Vanderbilt University. Following law school, she clerked for Justice Harry A. Blackman on the U.S. Supreme Court and for Just, Chief Justice Abner Mikva on the United States Court of Appeals for the DC circuit. So, five colleges, Hampshire colleges, join me in welcoming Michelle Alexander.